Um, now we're, I'd like to ask a few questions of the panel that really get at the role of Congress in ensuring human rights at home, and then we'll turn it over um, to our audience for your questions. Um, so this first uh, question is a, a bit of a two-part, and we'll, um, you know, anyone feel free to jump in. Um, to get a little bit of a groundwork, um, what, is, um, what is the role currently that Congress plays in ensuring the U.S. Um, implements the recommendations from the United Nations review bodies? And I guess in a more forward-looking or aspirational sense, I mean, what role can Congress or should Congress play in ensuring that uh, we meet our obligations under existing international human rights law? Should I go first? Sure, sure. Yeah, please feel free. From, yeah. from here, I think you have a small role in the back, but it's great. Uh, so I, I think that there are a number of ways that Congress can certainly be uh, uh, take uh, uh, its role in uh, implementing the United States human rights obligations. Uh, we're talking about uh, not only international commitments, general commitments that were made just by the executive branch, we're talking about specific commitments uh, that are treaty obligations, that are part of treaties that were ratified, which means that were treaties that were signed by the executive branch and brought to the consent and, uh, and approval of the Senate and won the two-third approval uh, of the Senate and essentially became the, the law of the land under the Constitution. And yet, the 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 problem or the, the, the challenges with, with the approach that's been going on for more than 20 years now is that once the United States ratifies treaties, just leave it to uh, as an inspirational document and leave it to the, just a general process of lawmaking without really going back to these documents and checking on are we doing what we promised the world to do. And so one of the things that would be important to do is, as part of a regular lawmaking, part of a regular oversight, is to look at what are the specific human rights obligations and commitments that the United States have. In many areas that you think of, for example, environmental justice or envir environmental general issues, you know, you have impact assessments that are being drawn to make sure that any policy does not impact, negatively impact the environment. And yet, when it comes to uh, human rights uh, obligations, you don't have a human rights impact assessment done seriously. I mean, there are certain aspects that are folded under more the like constitutional civil rights, civil liberties prison, but they are not taking into account the whole host of obligations that the United States has taken uh, as part of these treaty obligations. So the other thing is to push for these rights-based approach uh, policies uh, that you may, the, the administration may or may not be following, and to, to insist that these, these need to be taken into account. Uh, and more importantly, to effectuate uh, treaty obligations, and particularly uh, one of the things that is expected from the United States as a whole is to enact laws and policies and, and to, to make sure that the, 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 the domestic laws are in line with international obligations. And here's where there's a real gap in certain areas, certainly when we talk about the, uh, the current situation. And so, uh, for, to give you just a general exa example of, uh, from an area of racial profiling, uh, the United States has been consistently being um, uh, asked to pass a national legislation, a federal legislation that would ban the use of racial profiling, and to have incentives, have um, data collection, have uh, other kinds of uh, uh, mechanisms in order to ensure that uh, federal, state, and local governments are not engaged in racial profiling. And so ERPA has been reintroduced maybe 12 or 13 times every year. And I've been doing this work, particularly with ACLU, for 10 years. And I can tell you, every time we go to the United Nations Human Rights Review, there is specific recommendations. The United States has to pass legislation specifically naming ERA as the, as the legislation. So here you go. You have a piece of legislation that can be passed by Congress that will bring the United States in more fully compliance with international human rights obligations. And last one, I would say, it, when it comes to appropriations, when it comes to funding, a lot of the programs that are human rights based programs, what is it, you know, the trainings, what it has to do with uh, issues of even supporting some agencies that are important to enforce human rights, require those kinds of funding. So I think the appropriation process should be also based on our human rights commitments and prioritizing that such, you know, these, fu these, these fundings are not going to waste, but really going to, to save lives. 
to, to be cost effective in our in all everything we do. I mean, immigration is one example, and we can talk about other issues, but certainly that's the way that we see it. And certainly, the last thing is when you have the incentives, you know, to state and local governments. Here, I think uh, Congress has a critical role to play, so that they say, well, we will not run the, the show for you as a state government, but we can say that based on our international obligations that we have undertaken. We, we need to do things in order to make sure that we are doing what we need to do as a whole, as a, as a country. And here's a lot of incentives uh, with the grants, uh, with the issues of, of monitoring and access, <coughs> inspection, and, and so on. All, all of those things are so really tied into our international human rights obligations. Um, just to follow up on that, too, I think another important thing is that we lack a, a centralized body to conduct effective oversight and monitoring of our, our human rights obligations. So every other country that, that, that ratifies treaties um, has such a body that can receive complaints. Um, it's an, an independent mechanism that looks at how we're doing an implementation across all levels of government and all branches of government. Um, and the United States lacks one of these. So it's, it's actually quite difficult to go before these these review processes because it, we have to rely on the State Department, which is an external facing agency, to collect information from our, from you know, state and local governments, tribal entities, as well as, as what's happening domestically. It's not, it's not what they do, it's not what they do best, and it shouldn't be their role. And so we need to have a more robust role um, for a domestic human rights uh, agency to be able to collect that information, to report it up, and then most importantly, to be able to implement it back at home. Um, so, I mean, I think that Congress, in many ways, when it comes to implementation of our human rights obligations, as Jamil said, it sort of abdicates its role to the executive branch. And so, our recommendation from civil society would be like reclaim that role. This is these are these treaties are part of our law. Um, and need to be implemented in the same way that, that other laws are. So, and there's also, I should just say, like the, the U.S. Human Rights Network and other civil society organizations have invested a lot of time in figuring out what the best practices are for a national human rights institution. And the, there are guidelines on this. There's a, there's a whole body of work that exists around this. Um, so if people are interested, they should they should come talk to us because that that definitely exists. It's not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Great, so um, throughout the panel presentations, we heard about specific legislation, and Jamil just mentioned the um, uh, ending racial profile. Uh, yeah, ERPA, yes. Uh, the HEAL, uh, Katrina talk, discussed the HEAL for Immigrant Women and Families Act, um, and um, other pieces of legislation were elevated. I did want to provide one another opportunity just um, for our panelists to elevate. Are there any other specific recommendations that you would provide um, to the congressional staff here in the room today to address uh, some of the um, gaps? <laughs> no, I, mean, I guess I would just say that you know not everything that I mentioned is in a current bill, mm -hmm. but obviously that's not a reason that it because you can't be. And I would be happy to talk to anyone who is interested in in starting that process. Um, another piece, aside from the Heal Immigrant Women and Families Act, is um, increasing our investment in community health centers, but in particular, investing resources in, in services that are dedicated towards family planning and women's reproductive health. Um, a lot of what we're seeing is that states are, um, are taking aim at specific funding, state funding, that's, that's directed towards reproductive health services. And so the, the federal government is being left to fill the gap, right, in the safety net. Um, but, and the federal government's response has been, okay, well, we, you know, we have under the ACA, we really um, beefed up our investment in community health centers, which is terrific. But those, those centers don't actually fill the same type of need. There is still a great need for specialized family planning funding. Um, and in the, in the new um, appropriations bill, it's actually been zeroed out, all the funding for Title X. So it's really important to preserve that funding because those clinics that are able to reach women on the front lines are the ones that serve the women of the Rio Grande Valley, serve really hard to reach immigrant communities. 
um, that are largely uninsured and rely on those health centers. Whereas community health centers are also really important, but they tend to be located more in urban centers that are harder to access, and they lack the sort of specialized um, training that many family planning clinicians provide. They lack a full range of services and access to the most effective forms of contraception, for example. So there's a unique role for them and, and um, definitely urge like, a strong um, support for those clinics as, as we move forward. And I, and I could just add, I think our campaign has really talked about how immigration, comprehensive and humane immigration reform um, of the entire immigration system is really what's necessary to address a lot of the problems that we've been talking about. And so that is definitely the prize that we have our eyes on. Um, but the current climate, as Grace mentioned, makes, you know, makes that a little bit complicated. Um, and then in terms of family detention, one of the things that we've been advocating for is to really examine the root causes and kind of investments and development and addressing kind of the what why people are coming and migrating in the, in the ways that they are and the violence and um, uh, instability that's going on in some of those countries. Um, if I may just make, add one more thing. One of the common uh, issues that we see is that the the lack of access to justice and access to uh, particular legal representation mm -hmm. for particularly uh, immigrant communities, and certainly in the in, in the context of un undocumented uh, immigrants, and you have uh, in the last uh, years have been um, cut of funding, but also restrictions put on legal aid societies mm -hmm. in re in their in, in in basically in preventing them for uh, providing legal representation to one of the most vulnerable communities in our society, that is undocumented workers. And that's, that's certainly something that needs to be addressed. Uh, legal representation is a hallmark of the American legal system. If you start to cut legal representation and access to justice and due process, you know, you start with a slippery slope. You don't know where you end. And therefore, that, that's when you talk about human rights and intersectionality, you know, we see access to justice in a broader sense. Uh, it's, it's really to provide people with the ability to, to be able to, to, to access the court system and also other kinds of means so that they will be able to make their claims, be able to protect themselves. And certainly when you talk about immigrant women, uh, immigrant families, that's a certainly a huge problem that we're seeing. Even though whether it's you set the, the bond at $10,000 mm -hmm. or you, you set the facilities so far away from mm -hmm. any places where there is you know, uh, pro bono or uh, uh, affordable legal representation because that's one of the issues that I think is going to come back again and again. The question is whether Congress will take that seriously in engaging on this issue. So this is part and parcel of our our uh, tradition, uh, providing access to justice to everyone, regardless of their background, and certainly regardless of immigration status, should be the, the, the one of the, the things that we should set. Great. So with that, um, we'd like to see if there's any questions from you all from the audience. <laughs> Look at work. Yeah. <laughs> what was the um I forgot who said this, but there was a three hundred forty three per family in, in detention to keep them in detention? That's how much it costs? Yes, three hundred forty three dollars per day. Oh, per day. Mm -hmm. And then I have another question. Where can I see this at these facilities? I mean, particularly to be inspired to help because I mean I didn't know there was this much kind of abuse going on and uh and we, I come from a family, uh, from a family of uh, undocumented workers and people, but now I've gained citizenship. Mm -hmm. So I just want to see. I'm from Arizona, so the infamous as <laughs> Yeah, um, a lot of the uh, tours are facilitated and arranged through ICE, um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, part of Department of Homeland Security. Um, I, are you working in a member's office? Yeah, okay. with uh, Congressman Ruben Gallo, the mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So um, I think that that could be an inquiry that your off that the office makes okay. and, and facilitated that way. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I got a question too. Uh, if I can recall, um, you said something about you guys are like two congressional representatives that basically in Texas, and who are those representatives? Uh, the question was specific to the representatives. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah like like the oh, the two visiting. Yeah. Oh yes. So um, so last week it was announced that a delegation of about ten. Members of Congress mm -hmm. are um, 
uh, doing a uh, you know conducting a delegation tour to of the two um, family residential facilities and family detention facilities in Texas. So I think they're there right now, mm -hmm. um, and I don't have the full list with me, but um, Cindy Hoyer um, and the, the two congresswomen who sponsored this event are there. Um, and so I would you know check in with those offices. I'm sure we will see. Um, um, I'm not sure if they're planning to do a press briefing afterwards, but I'm sure that they'll, they will be doing some public dissemination um, um, of their reflections and what they've seen at the facilities. I know um, several members have visited the other facilities um, actually on several occasions, and those offices have been put, um, disseminating information about their tours. Yeah. Um, so that, that will be a very helpful resource, I think. So yeah, yeah um, this is not several people from Arizona, so immigration is very you know, significant issue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and with regard to my congressman, he has been very big on immigration and stuff. It's something he always advocate for us. So, um, we would make sure that that's something we're going to talk to the congressman to see if we can introduce legislation. And I'll say he's been very right now, outspoken on immigration. So, I think this is very informative. And I want to say thank you so much to all you guys. And we'll make sure that we you know, talk to, that, like, to the congressman. Fantastic. Right? Thank you. Right. <laughs> I, wish, I, I wish I have so many questions to ask, but it's because you know, we have time and you know, we have time. So Fantastic. Well, we'll, be, we'll be here for a while, um, certainly. So please oh, feel free to come to yeah, us. Sure, yeah, thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll, we'll take a few more. I think we have um, I think we have another minute or two. And I see a few questions. So we'll, we'll definitely take those. Um, uh, you next, and then we'll, we'll get to you afterwards. Thank you. I'm Michelle Banger with Dignity Health, and I'm just so oh, grateful that I'm in town to be able to get all this information. I, I just didn't really even, wasn't so aware of all the international treaties and obligations that were, uh, we said that we would be committed to. Um, just a couple of technical questions. What does it mean to have something signed but not ratified? Mm -hmm. And then once things are ratified, um, I, I know this is the issue is that you know we don't have accountability after we've already said that you know we're committing to these things but um, what, what does that mean to the inter international community when we're reneging on our obligations and our commitments I mean do we just get a slap in the hand do we get oh you know those funny Americans you know <laughs> what, what, what does what is the veracity mm -hmm. and force here of you know, what we're doing absolutely uh, I mean, the, the quick answer to a question, it's a, you know, can go on and on, but <laughs> when you sign a treaty, uh, you're basically saying, you know, I'd like those, those, those rights, I, you know, but I'm not going to get uh, too serious about the relationship that with those rights. Uh, but at the same time, you make a commitment not to defeat the purpose and object of the treaty. So certainly that says for those treaties that it's signed, you know, it, it has international obligations not to do things that would defeat those commitments. Mm -hmm. But when you ratify the treaties, then you say, I'm really serious about that now. I'm, I'm really going to do, and I'm going to invest more resources, I'm going to do changes in our laws and policies, I'm going to try to, uh, to, to see, identify the gaps, and, and, and make sure that our policies and laws are consistent with these international commitments. And then on a periodic and regular basis, you do that. It's not like a one-time thing and you get, get, get over with it. Mm -hmm. It's a really an ongoing conversation. And that's why when we talked about the monitoring bodies, this is a reminder every few years, uh, you go back and you check your record and see what's going on. So we've been very much doing just the reporting process here in the US for the last 20 years. But not really the serious stuff, the heavy lift of Okay, let's identify the gaps. Where are we doing? How are we doing with these kind of substantive rights uh, that are in those treaties? Uh, certainly, whenever there is uh, Supreme Court rulings uh, over the last you know, 10, 15 years, or so, particularly in the area of criminal justice, they were hailed as advancing the United States in fully complying with its international obligations. But then we're still in certain areas. We're still out of step with the rest of the world, even though we sign and ratify treaties. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process. It requires a lot of engagement from civil society, but also from all acts of, you know, from courts, from Congress, to continue to check on the government, how they're doing, but also engagement with state and local government. This is an area, a lot of the issues that we discuss have direct impact uh, and have the role and jurisdiction of state and local governments, and they need to be brought to this conversation as well. So that's, that's how, uh, you know, the, the, the model of, of in co continuing engagement on it. In reviewing and implementing human rights obligations. And I mean, just to follow up, and sort of what are the consequences globally if we don't right, follow up? Right. And I, you know, I think our legitimacy um, as a country that purports to enforce uphold human rights comes from our, the fact that we actually model that. 
So when we go to the Human Rights Council, the United States government goes to the, United States, to the Human Rights Council and um, argues forcefully for the implementation of human rights in other countries, and we're not doing that at home, then our legitimacy is undermined and there's very little incentive, as Natalie mentioned, to follow through with that. We see that all the time in the area of reproductive health. Um, so you know, strong commitments that, are, that the United States tries to take forward internationally around um, decriminalizing access to abortion, access to contraception, <coughs> adequately funding and investing in women's health overseas, our failure to do that at home undermines our legitimacy to effectuate that outside our borders. Uh, three questions. Um, one's for Ms. Hafiz. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Um, on the topic of family detention, uh, what are the conditions that you know of any in the first uh, detention center? Are they similar to those in Texas, or mm. do you have any knowledge of that? Yeah, the Burke, the um, Burks, the women, the mothers at Burks have recently also been um, engaging in a work stoppage and a hunger strike. I believe they are also. Um, protesting the conditions um, that they're facing. And there's actually an NGO um, tour of Sparks facility going on today. So I think that um, after that, there'll be some press uh, calls and meetings with members and maybe a briefing on the, on the conditions at Sparks. So more to come on that um, from people that have actually been there will be probably this week or next. Ms. Anderson, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you focused on the Bureau of Raja Bali and the communities that are medically underserved. Are there other communities that we should be aware of that are underserved that deserve our attention? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we've we've focused. The reason that we focused on the Rio Grande Valley, just for context, is because um, because of the particular attacks on reproductive health that had happened in Texas. Um, because the Lower Rio Grande Valley is one of the poorest areas in the United States, one of the most medically underserved. Texas has a highest, uh, one of the highest immigrant populations in the country. So there were lots of reasons why that area made sense to focus on as part of this broader problem. Um, all of the border areas of Texas have a similar problem. Um, we've also, through our connection with the National Latina Institute, and maybe Natalie, you want to speak about this, but we've, we've also looked in West Texas and El Paso. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done documentation in other border communities, but certainly many of the same problems exist. Also, I know you all are starting to look at Florida, mm -hmm. so maybe maybe you should just hand it over to you. Yeah, I'll just I'll just briefly touch on the fact that you know the confluence of federal restrictions on immigrants' access to health care with the policies that have been enacted in 1996 and post 1996, with state restrictions, with all the compounding barriers related to language and immigration enforcement, um, really, really create you know just you know insurmountable barriers for many immigrants across many communities of, um, in the United States and. Um, just on the policy end, we see a patchwork of policies related to eligibility. And so, you know, we work in um, uh, the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. We have advocacy um, chapters in Texas, Florida, Virginia, um, and we partner with um, organizations in California and Colorado. And we just see many, many of the same patterns related to um, barriers to access to health care and then the, the consequences of that for their health and well being and their family economic security. So, I'd be happy to touch a little bit more in depth with you later afterwards. Yeah. And just my last question, okay. um, I think we oftentimes overlook the power of the youth, um, especially in this room, we see a lot of people that are younger than congressmen and women. Um, do you have any advice just in our town on what you can do to rectify these conditions or help motivate people to be more focused and more channeled and to hear the youth voice on these issues that sometimes we don't even speak up? Um, I mean, I think what, you, I think, you're exactly right. I think one of the um, one of the factors that that younger people definitely have going for them is that they're not uh, so jaded. <laughs> you know, things are so surprised. I, you know, when you're young, you're so surprised when you hear about injustices. I think a lot of times when you're older, you sort of feel like, oh yeah, I heard that before. Um, and I think definitely the energy you can bring is something that a lot of people who are older don't have. I would just add here, I think there's so, so many good examples where you know, youth have been involved in driving you know, uh, uh, attention to the issues of the dreamers, mm -hmm. uh, certainly the area of, you know, of criminal justice, you know, Black Lives Matter are driven by you know, youth and young uh, uh, activists, you know, and you go from one area to another area, in all these areas, we see that 
the, their strong sentiment, uh, you know, against injustice, but also support for human rights. Mm -hmm. And they don't see it, you know, the same category. Oh, you put me in this category, and it doesn't, you know, if I, there's no, uh, there's no law applies to me, and then that's it. No, they see it in a new universal way. They see the interdependence. They see the issues are connected. They see the economic injustices as a matter of urgency. And I think that uh, the new, you know, way of communication now that we're having, the social media, all this stuff that is making it much easier for people to communicate, but also to drive awareness and to get people to do something about it. That I think it, it, we, we should learn from it from the youth movement uh, and get them, as you said, more involved in driving and being part and have a say in what we are doing in this country because this is the future. This is what they really see uh, for for the next generations. Wonderful. With that, we will conclude. Please join me in thanking our panelists for being here today. And I believe uh, most of our panelists will be able to um, stay for a few more minutes. And thank you very much for your interest and for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.